started Smart Growth VC with a bunch of other people, Linda Allen, who at that point was with Coast Environmental Law Association, Ken Milamed, uh, Chi and Ho was our first executive director, who's now the ED of the Center for Sustainability in Whistler. Um, and the entire purpose was to provide a community-based outlet for activism around land use in British Columbia. So throughout the United States, there are lots of different either statewide or local land use groups that have a very uh, intense watchdog kind of purpose and pro good development um, interaction with their communities. So whether it be Smart Growth Vermont or the original one was Thousand Friends of Oregon um, uh, started in the 1970s, very much around a sustainable community mandate of compact, complete communities where transportation and services are available in uh, neighborhoods uh, with affordable housing. Following up on that, yeah, what good. would you most be interested in learning from us as we travel through places like Sweden and Denmark with respect to land use planning and, and resource management and things like that? What would you be most curious about? Yeah, so I think all good land use planning starts with citizens who inherently know what it takes to make a good neighborhood, which is you're within walking distance of services Everybody walks with or is, has walking distance of transit, and I think Europe does it very well. In particular, the main everything starts and ends with growth management and containing urban areas. Because if you don't contain urban areas, you always have what is perceived as the market to sprawl, which is complete garbage. But we'll leave that for another day. So I'm most interested in how communities then institutionalize those good land use practices. So how is it that in um, the Netherlands, for example, you have no suburbs. It is, you go from urban area and there's a hard line and then you have agricultural land. And we do that very poorly still in North America. And how is it that they're able to do that? Is there like one city that you would kind of look to as a shining example of really amazing land use planning and growth containment? Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of good examples from Europe, but in my work, I hesitate to use those examples because they have different legal systems. So if we want in North America to point to something that works in terms of adopting it into our framework locally and being able to talk about it in a kind of a credible way, I often look to Oregon that has a statewide land use law that requires every urban area to create an urban containment boundary or growth containment boundary. But then before you can pierce that boundary, you have to justify that you actually need more land to build on. And they also have very specific and intense rules around resource land protection. So that's not only agricultural land, but forest land. So you cannot have any other use in those zones. And if you want to build more than one house, you have to justify it. So similar to our agricultural land reserve here in British Columbia, which is, you know, it's, it is the shining example uh, North America wide. But in terms of a comprehensive regime, it's got its problems. But I point to Oregon most of the time. Is there anything we can do to change this paradigm of urban sprawl into agricultural land as, as students and citizens, really? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Every decision maker that you speak to bring up the issue of urban containment and agricultural land protection. And that, I mean, I think we're really well placed in British Columbia to continue that conversation and to show that we have a very high level of support. Only 4% of BC you can actually grow or do anything with in terms of food production. That is a non-renewable resource and it's mostly located in the valley bottoms where most of the development occurs. So Fraser Valley, Southern Vancouver Island. And so it is, I mean, it's, there is zero question that we can build on any of it. And so in just talking with decision makers, in buying locally and supporting our local farm economy, and in really, uh, you know, what this type of class can do and what you guys can do in all areas of your life is increase the literacy around land use and the sophistication with which we talk about land use. So it's not just, we have to build single family homes in Langford to get more affordable housing. That's a very low level market driven conversation about the way in which we grow and develop. And by starting with urban containment and creating compact complete communities where more affordable housing can be created, that creates a much more sophisticated level of how we do community development really. Um. Jumping back to Oregon, uh, most of my knowledge of land use and stuff like that is specifically very urban, so my big thing with Oregon will be Portland. And my understanding is that the um, 
the legislation and procedures that they have in place to make development more difficult has made Portland in particular really, really, really expensive and very incredibly difficult to kind of move into since the market in, like is so limited on housing since they're not building anymore. Can you speak a little bit? Yeah, so I'm happy to speak to that because I actually, um, I have uh, debated people on CBC a few times around this issue that, for example, the agricultural land reserve, because you can't build on it, the same argument is, therefore we have more uh, higher housing prices in Greater Vancouver or whatever. So that's a very simple supply and demand argument that doesn't play out in a land market. In particular, an international land market, which all of British Columbia and all of the Western United States is in. So as long as you have money flooding in from overseas and other areas, you're never going to have a sort of a complete picture or be able to really pinpoint what are the drivers of cost and the drivers of growth. There's a study out of Harvard by Harry Glazer who, who did a pan look at all of the growth management studies about does growth management actually increase costs and he found that uh, you know everything else being equal it's actually the rate of growth, meaning the rate of people moving there, not the land availability, that increase costs the most. And then also that the places that had the highest land costs also had the best affordable housing programs. So Denver and Houston have virtually no affordable housing programs because they allow suburban sprawl to occur all over the place, whereas Portland has an extensive uh, affordable housing program. The other thing as people are interested in sustainability that we have to really focus on when we talk about growth management, you know, compact complete communities and what the impact of growth management is on housing affordability is what is sustainable over the long term. And building single detached homes is the most expensive form of housing. So if we play that forward 50 years, you have these, you know, these complete energy sucks for the vast majority of the time taking up all sorts of land that provide no ecosystem services, and I'm happy to argue with you about the benefits of backyards for birds, it is so much better to build on a quarter of the footprint and leave the rest of it to farmland or to forest land in terms of you know, benefits to ecosystems than to count all these backyards as some kind of contiguous green belt that we have some sort of um, ecological benefit from. And so in that sense, as we play forward our societies, what do we want in terms of sustainability? And single detached housing forms are not it. They're not going to get us there. So you, said, you, you talked about how we have a big uh, issue with gaining farmland, but also people to work that farmland in BC. There's a, you know, there's a huge shortage. So what can we do to increase the amount of people that are working in agriculture and working on yeah, great question. And this is my, so I'm a huge agricultural land reserve proponent, but my one issue with it is how do we get more people being able to live on agricultural land who actually farm the land? So one of our primary ways of protecting agricultural land is you are not able to use land in the ALR for non-farm purposes unless you get permission from the Agricultural Land Commission, which is a provincial commission, or it's by regulation. So there's this obscure regulation that lists a bunch of things you can do on farmland as of right. The main sticker, though, is you can only have one single detached home on a piece of farmland. So if I own 10 acres of farmland, I can only have one single detached home. So even if I do intensive organic market gardening of salad greens, let's say, I employ 20 people to do that, very lucrative in this kind of market. I can't have them live on the site with me. So that's inherently unsustainable because I'm 20 kilometers out of Victoria. So then those people need to travel either rent in the area or travel from a more rent intensive kind of area. So this is the one aspect of the agricultural land reserve that I think we need to bust open and reform to create the ability for, for example, four young families or four people buy our agricultural land together and farm it in common. They don't break it up into four or five acre pieces, they farm it in common. But the challenge is how to do it in a sensitive way such that developers don't just start buying up the 20 acre parcels, have one person farming it and then build big houses on an acre and then you, get, you still get that phenomena of it's essentially rural sprawl, right? I then work my law job in Victoria and I drive my 20 kilometers up to North Saanich and live in my big house on agricultural land. So that's a very active law reform conversation that's going on in British Columbia right now between people who want to get into farming, in particular people who want to co-own land together and can't have 
you know, a cluster of housing or one big deta detached home with four different suites in it. Currently, that's not allowed under the agricultural land regulations. That's it. Thank you. Minor hockey. You guys don't want to talk about minor hockey. Okay, one. <laughs> was actually just about to. Okay, one. Right Ask the question, buddy. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, you mentioned North Sandin, right? So did your kids play for the Peninsula Eagles? No, so my kids play for Victoria Minor Hockey or regional teams. Oh, dude, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, but here's my beef. I'm a lifelong uh, cyclist commuter. My mother put me on my bike when I was five years old and I've always cycle commuted. I have, I've driven a car from time to time in the sense of uh, in the Yukon in the middle of winter, but it's never been my primary mode. And here I am, a mother of two children who are now turning teenagers, and they're very intense on their sports, in particular minor hockey. So this past weekend, yet again, is this hockey season? No, this is May. <laughs> We're supposed to be outside in the beautiful weather, but no, my daughter's trying out for some team up in Campbell River. And so we're driving, right? So this is my conflict as someone who is committed to sustainability. The only reason I do law is to promote environmental law. And here I have, uh, I'm caught up in this mm. crazy psycho world of children's <laughs> sports that has no sustainability aspect to it at all. Mm. 